Alright, my friends, welcome to another episode of Christian Podcast. Today is a very special day. We're going to learn how to live free outside of our own prison cells. And we're going to talk with a guest, Scott Heiberger. He's the person behind The Wire Ministries. And we're going to talk about a little bit of his story, how he got there, how he got to be free and what he does now, how he helps people live free lives and what does that mean for us today so stick around for the show all right welcome scott how you doing today i'm doing good good to be here with you awesome thank you for being here well scott you know me i'm gonna start with an emoji reaction so i want to go to you and see out of the five emojis What's the biggest idea that you have for us today? And what emoji would you categorize it under? I would say divine. Uh, divine because of the touch of Christ on my life. Uh, you know, I, I was living a life that I was an unbe I don't even think that I believed in God for, you know, for a lot of years. And I got into crime and drugs and alcohol. And I was just kind of living my life up and down and all around. And uh, I went to a horror movie um, to go see uh, the movie, The Exorcism of, of Emily Rose. And while I was in that film, uh, something wild happened, something crazy happened that I began to experience the presence of God. Wow. And, um, you know, and even though that I didn't know anything about God, I didn't know if I even believed in God. But when God came in the room, I knew it was God. And, uh, you know, it rattled me in such a way that I went out to the parking lot. I'm with my girlfriend at the time and I'm shaking like a leaf. I'm crying because I didn't even know how to explain what I was going through, what I was dealing with. You know, what I didn't even know how to explain what was happening. And, uh, you know, I ended up going, you know, to her apartment and getting in the yellow pages. Uh, some, of, some of our viewers, your viewers will remember the, the days <laughs> where there was yellow pages in the phone book, right? Yes. Wow. <laughs> So I, so I went to go look through the yellow pages for a church because I didn't have any idea, you know, anything about any of this. And I was going to try to get some answers. Well, I ended up going to, uh, it didn't find anybody on the phone. And then the very next day I got picked up on a felony warrant to go to jail. And I did something I had never done before after uh, tons of arrests and in, in and out of the system. I said, I need a Bible. And I began to read the Bible and search the scriptures for what had happened in that theater. And about two weeks later, while I was in the county jail, I got invited to a church service inside there. And I went and I heard the gospel for the first time. And when I heard that gospel, it penetrated, you know, and I ended up coming forward in tears. And, um, you know, I professed Christ. And then that made a turn of my life that changed the very course of my life. But it all began from what I believe was a tap on my shoulder in that horror movie, something divine happened wow. and, it, and it got me looking. Yeah. It got me looking. And then I responded and I heard the gospel and it just shifted the course of my life. So I would definitely say the emoji divine okay. from that tap on my shoulder that day that changed the course of my life. Okay. So the belifometer to kick off the episode is none other than the divine emoji and there you have it my friends wow i mean what a what an incredible way to kick off the episode and also almost like that contrast of, of being watching a horror movie right and to think that maybe i mean I, i it's been a while since i watched a horror movie and but but the thing that that's where the light shines brighter Right. So, I mean, that's so interesting. So we want to let uh, get to know a little bit of that story. Right. So you said you were living a life of crime and that you no, know, you were convicted for some felonies. I read on your website that uh, it said you had 35 arrests, eight felony convictions and five sentences. So tell us a, a little bit about that. Like, how does one person get to... To that point, what, what what was it about your life? Maybe your upbringing. Was there any, uh, you know, I don't know, lack of father figure in your life? Was it, was there anything like that, or where do you think pointed you to to that type of life? 
You know, I ended up, I grew up in, in a pretty rough neighborhood, you know, we're in a school system where I was the minority and you drop any minority off into a school system, they're going to have trouble. And I happen to be living in one. And, you know, I just went through a lot of, a lot of fighting, a lot of trouble and just grew up just angry, you know, and constantly getting in trouble at school. And then it, I didn't have a lot of parental supervision. I was running the streets very young. And uh, so I think it was a combination of growing up in, in a, in a brutal school system, but also without that, that parental oversight that I needed either, you know, so those things working together was kind of the ingredients for destruction for me. And by the time I was 12 years old, I'm, I'm drinking, I'm using drugs, I get arrested. And then I begin this cycle of being incarcerated at 12 years old in addiction. So I became a regular customer at the local juvenile detention center. I was in and out of the detention center. Then I went to juvenile prisons. And then, you know, eventually at 17, I get waived to adult court and I'm in juvenile prisons. I'm now I'm in the adult uh, jail system. By the time I'm 18 years old, I'm going off to adult prison. So I'm, I'm, I just get into this cycle and, and I began to take on this identity as a career criminal. Mm. And, you know, f- fast forwarding, you know, when I'm 28 years old, uh, you know, I got around 30 arrests on my record at this point. And that's that moment when I was, um, you know, had all those arrests, been drinking and using drugs for, you know, 15 years. And my life was a complete mess. I mean, just crack cocaine, dragging me down into the mud, um, just living a life like an animal, way less than God's design. And then, you know, and like I said, I didn't even know if I believed in God. I I didn't really think too much about it. I wasn't, I didn't grow up in that kind of a household. So here I am 28 years old and I built this momentum and this identity of just this crazy career criminal and I go to this horror movie with a girlfriend for entertainment. And little did I know that it was a setup by God that I would enter into that theater that night and God would tap me on the shoulder and it would change the course of my life. And, uh, you know, I ended up receiving Christ in the county, ended up getting out of jail. And I, I went off to prison that time, got out of jail, and I tried to really get connected Um more with the with God, but I didn't get connected to the church and I didn't get connected to godly people. So you, before I knew it, you know, what I like to say is a stronger culture wins. I was I, I was new in Christ, but I didn't get connected to God's people. And before you know it, I'm, I'm back doing the same things that I was doing. And, uh, you know, and it got worse, you know, just like the Bible says, you know, you get that the taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, if you drift away and, you know, when you get off on the wrong path, you know, it could get a whole lot uh, crazier. Well, it did for me, you know, it got, it got a lot messier. My story isn't that I answered the call of God and then I ramped up and everything got good. All of a sudden I, God really wrecked my life, changed the course of my life, but I went down before I came up. Mm-hmm. Wow. What were you feeling when you were under that cycle? You know, when, when, um, let's just say you're a young man growing up and you start the before it becomes a cycle, you're just making decisions, right? And I know you you talk about almost like every decision you make, kind of like it's what's gonna build up our prisons, right? So yes. what decisions do you think you were making, and what were they based on on emotions? Like I'm I, what I'm trying to do is that you know for any of the younger audience that's maybe listening that can resonate with the type of life that you lived, that they might be living. And maybe mm-hmm. some of those sentiments and maybe some of those feelings they're feeling now are similar to those. So could you, could you, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's, it's, it's okay to go back to those days, right? But yes. what were the emotions you were feeling as a young man uh, under uh, starting basically the cycle of what was going to be a, a criminal life? See, I was naive and inexperienced in life, immature, you know, so I'm thinking drugs and alcohol. I'm just having a few beers. I'm smoking a little weed. I'm just having fun with my friends. But what I talk about a lot uh, today is what you repeat grows stronger. So the habits that you're forming now, they go from what you do to who you become. And I say that you step behind the wire of an invisible prison. See, there's prisons that got razor wire fences physical ones, but then there's invisible prisons, there's spiritual prisons 
that we form around ourselves through habits that are being formed when we're young. We're thinking we're just at a party having fun, you know, doing what we do, you know, that philosophy YOLO, I only live once, I got to do it all and I got to try it all and do it all. But that's the road to destruction, which we don't, you know, young people don't usually think about it like that. See, because I say YOLO, but I say you only live once and I got to make this life count. I got to be focused because I only get one of them. Back then, I'm like, you know, I only live once. I got to try everything. But all those things can be very destructive. You know, the Bible says that it's the wide path that leads to hell. You know, it's the narrow path that leads to life. And, you know, not many people are on that. And I wasn't thinking about that. It wasn't even on my radar when I was young that there was a narrow path that I needed to live on purpose for a purpose by God. And so here I am living wide open and I am repeating these these habits and they're forming an invisible prison around me that I'm becoming shackled and bound spiritually and don't even know it. So by the time I hit my 20s, I'm a maximum security prisoner, whether I'm in a jail or I'm sitting at home. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's very interesting. So what were you in jail? Like, did you spend time inside behind the wire? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As a juvenile, you know, so I was, I was, creating that cycle of, you know, going in and out because what was happening and I was young and I was just drinking and having fun and not thinking about that there was spiritual change forming. But at the same time, uh, I was an angry kid and rebellious and that that I had a little bit of maybe um, restraint. Those walls were coming down when I was intoxicated or if I was using drugs, so I was becoming a lot more reckless. So the more that though I was forming those habits, the more reckless I was becoming, the more wild that I was becoming. And uh, there was just no limits. You know, I would literally have to get stopped by going to a juvenile detention center or going to a juvenile prison uh, because uh, I had no restraint, you know, and I had no real target or focus for my life. So I was just wide open. And that's just be it went from that's what I was doing to who I became a wild man. Uh, that was wide open on drugs and alcohol. And uh, I just, you know, before I knew it, that it had a, such a strong hold on me, I couldn't shake it loose even if I wanted to. Wow. But, yeah, that's so interesting. I'm, I mean, I'm marveled by, by how much, I mean, from what I, I'm witnessing from the website, you know, and your story, and there's a movie out there with Michael W. Smith in it uh, that talks about your story. So that's that's pretty epic, right? But to think that... Before this tap on the shoulder, and and I think we're gonna, you know, get to the tap on the shoulder a little bit more. But before we get there, it's just so interesting, almost like walking a life without knowing Christ and 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 in your own strength, in a sense, right? But what does it? Do you think when people are inside behind the wire, um, do you think there's anything you could say? to young people who are maybe making those bad choices, right? And maybe for now, the bad choice is, is I don't know, it's it's drugs or it's alcohol. So it's not further down the road, you know, facing uh, detention or facing being in jail or things like that. You know, it's, it's the first step they take. Do you think there's a real sense of like, can you give them a warning that will prevent them from ever stepping to a place like a, a real prison? Or do you think you had to go through that process so that you would, you know, eventually know the the, the right path with Christ? Like, what, what is there anything you can say to the young yeah. man, you know, out there, uh, like avoid? <laughs> yeah, there's an there's an expression that says uh, fool, fools learn from their own mistakes, but wise people learn from the mistakes of others. So it's always better. <laughs> If you can to learn from the mistakes of others, and that's that's why that's that's wise living. But you know, these like I, I have said, like there's these chains, there's a spiritual element to this that I'll, that young people uh may not know about, they're not even aware of, that's not even on their radar, that there is a spiritual element to alcohol and drug abuse, and there's chains being formed around their hearts around their minds as they're pursuing this life. And they think that they're just young, having fun. And, you know, it's harmless. 
Um, I mean, besides the physical damage that drugs do to you, ob those, that's obvious. They, they, most kids understand that, that there's damage that's happening, but they think that they're invincible, mm -hmm. which they're not, um, you know, because kids are young people are dying left and right. You know, they're, they're trying this or trying that and, and not, and not, they're not here anymore. Um, but what happens is, is they begin to form these strongholds, spiritual strongholds that by the time they realize that there's a spiritual forces that power that's 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 binding binding them together by the time they realize that they're already chained up they're already locked up and they need a savior and they maybe they don't know it and now they're now they're living a life uh way less than what they were born to live and they're 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 living way below like think about it like this I started drinking and using drugs when I was 12 just to have fun with friends. And I was in middle school. And, you know, and by the time I'm 25 years old, I'm a homeless, drug addict, crackhead, living out on the street, homeless, begging for change outside of a building. Never crossed my mind when I'm at, when I was young, I was a teenager taking that first drug and that drink that I ever thought that I would end up a homeless beggar out on the street. But I did. And that's that's where that kind of life can lead or will lead or worse, dead, because many of my friends that I grew up with that did all the same things that I was doing, they're not here anymore. Mm. They're, they're gone. And so. Wow. Yeah, it's intense. I I mean, I can relate uh, to some extent because of <laughs> um, neighbors, really neighbors I'd had that um, you know, we're making their own choices. And then I could totally see how prisons were building around themselves, even without them noticing. And eventually to, I mean, so sadly, but to one of them, it led to death where, you know, he, he got into a car accident and died at age 16. And I mean, that's, that's been, I mean, kind of like a, you know, a really painful journey for the family, but getting to know the story has been uh, you no know, tremendously sad, but at the same time, I mean, there's, there's always hope, right? And, Yeah. Um, it's so interesting that you mentioned almost like growing up with that, that without the, the sense of like, there is a God, there's, there's Jesus or there's redemption. Uh, but then having this tap on your shoulder in one of those dark places, you know, watching a horror movie, I mean, that speaks volumes to the way God can work in even the worst situations. Right. So, uh, I mean, that's super hopeful. So what do you think? Do you think everybody that's undergoing their their own decisions and maybe their own prisons, would you say God's always tapping on their shoulder? Or do you think there was, uh, why do you think you felt that tap on the shoulder? What was that like for you that, that maybe some other people are, are they not feeling it or are they, is God not reaching out to them? Why do you think that is? I think God's timing is perfect. And I think that he's always there and he's, He's making himself aware, but there's different points in your life that you may be more receptive to it. And he's always communicating. He's always tapping, so to speak. Uh, but there's moments when you're more receptive. And I, in that moment, I was very low and very humble that, at that moment. And I was in a very, you know, a, an ugly place, you know, a dark place. And, um, you know, and I, and I, I was aware, you know, I became aware and, you know, And maybe, maybe just maybe they got tapped a little louder than normal, but he got my attention at that moment, you know, and I tell people all the time, it's ready when it's ready, mm. you know, so, you know, God is masterfully, you know, orchestrating things and allowing things and doing things to kind of help, you know, get you on course to the plan. You know, there's one thing I want to say to a young person right now that's on, uh, that's on my mind right now is that. I think that a lot of this uh, also where young people can get on this, this track of drugs, alcohol, crime, they, they begin this pattern is because they're following the lead of maybe a mother or a father. And they think that their parents' life is their life. Mm -hmm. And I, what I want to say to somebody that's listening, somebody that's watching is that you're not your parents. They may have decided, they may have, made a real mess of their life using drugs, you can use an alcohol, they may have been incarcerated, they may be incarcerated right now. But you can make a decision as a young person right now, to rise above the occasion to be to rise above that you're not your parent, 
that you can do something different, that God got a plan for your life, and it could be much greater. Uh, it could be much different, but you are not them, that you, God made you to be you with a with a distinct pur purpose uh, for your life, and uh, you can decide to do that now and not wait. Yes. Wow. That's There's so much power right there. I, I know, I'm not going to say names, uh, but I know of a mother who got into drugs, had kids, the kids were you no know, removed from her, and then they're in the in the care of the grandma, right? And these kids are super young. I mean, maybe the old there's four kids total, and probably the oldest is around maybe seven or eight. And I can help but think the exact words you're saying right now that you know your story is not defined by the life your parents lived. I mean, that's super powerful. And I hope, you know, when people listen to this episode, this will resonate with so many that, um, yeah, like I was learning, right, that the past can shape you, but it doesn't define you. So right. there's that part of your life that, that in a sense, you, you gotta, you can take control of, even though coming to Christ, it's surrendering, but even that surrendering, it takes a decision, right? So what was that decision for you with this tap on the shoulder, this dark moment in a horror movie? Uh, what was that decision of coming to Christ? What was so compelling about uh, the life Christ offered? What was that like for you? I just, I, you know, look at thinking about it. It was, I could just, I just knew that there was a God at that point. And it, it caused like a, deep fear, not like a scary fear, just a reverence. You know, I just, I knew that I was in awe. I was rattled. I was like, you know, I, I just couldn't, couldn't believe it, you know? And so that's, you know, the next day I got picked up on a warrant to go to jail. And that was really a setup by God, you know, that, that because I asked for a Bible and I'd been arrested like 30 times and I never got a Bible, never, I thought it was a joke. I'd see guys incarcerated and they'd have Bibles and go to prayer meetings and go to church services. And I just thought it was a joke, you know, and then here it is, you know, God taps on my shoulder in this theater. And the very next day I go to jail and I, I pick up a Bible and I'm hungry and I'm searching and I'm looking for answers. And then two weeks into that jail sentence, I get invited to a church service and I hear the gospel for the first time. And when I heard that good news, it got in to my heart. It was the right time, the right moment. And, you know, I, I repented, put my faith in Christ and it just, it literally changed the course of my life. And, uh, you know, in ever since that moment, I've never been able to turn away from the Lord. You know, I had my ups and downs in the beginning because, you know, there's a whole sanctification, get your mind holy process after that, you know, it's a free gift we receive from Christ, but then we got work to do with Christ after that, you know, in our heads, you know, and so there was a, a lot of that going on, you know, that, you know, that kind of up and down in the beginning, but the truth and the reality of what happened when I responded to the gospel is the evidence today. It's the fruit of the life today and what God has done and what he continues to do. So definitely, you know, it's just, it's been an adventure for sure. Wow. Yes. And oof. I mean, I, I have so many questions that I almost don't know which one I want to go next, but I'm going to trust the spirit. Uh, so I know of somebody who just got released mm -hmm. um, out of prison, right? What would be your advice for somebody that kind of like grew up knowing of Christ, knowing of the Lord? I don't know what his experience was inside. If he, you know, if he was close to a group, I'm, I'm almost sure there was some sort of, you know, outreach within the, you know, the walls or the confines of prison. But I mean, regardless, once you're out, whether for, uh, you know, your sentence done and, and you're free, right? Are you really free? What would be your advice to a somewhat of a young man who's ready to explore the world again and having a little bit of that background of, of who Christ is? I'd say get connected to the local church. Mm. It's the hope of the world. There's security, there's safety there. We got to get connected. We got to get in the herd. You know, it's out on the fringes when we're alone is when, where we're, we get in trouble. Uh, when we isolate and we get in our heads, we need to get in connected to the body of Christ. We need to begin to serve in the, in the church, get, get involved. And if, 
Uh, and if you need more accountability, you, you maybe get into a, a recovery center. Like I, I founded one, you know, that's what we do. Uh, that's what I do for a living, you know, besides going into prisons all around the country, we have a recovery center that my wife and I have founded and, you know, to get into a program, you know, to help you get stronger on your feet, you know, and all those practical things that you need help on, especially if you weren't raised in a, in a way that really learned all those practical things, how to walk with God and how to just handle all the normal adult things, you know, adulting 101 that we all got to learn how to do, you know, so maybe we might need a recovery center, a Christian organization to live in for a little while. But at the same time, if not that, uh, is getting connected to the local church and getting involved. So you're um, not only getting to know people, but you're all allowing others to get to know you and get a mentor in your life. Find somebody in there, a guy that's got some experience, that's got some longevity, that's, you know, that's a leader in the church and, and, and um, make yourself known and accountable to at least that person, if not the pastor, and, and really begin that process of walking with God and God's people and not isolating and, and getting off, you know, and in, in the wrong things and, you know, or even just being by yourself can just be bad trouble. Wow. Yeah, that's so good. And I'm thinking of that occasion when the disciples come back to Jesus and they're all beat up uh -huh. and they couldn't, they couldn't cast out some demons. And once they, they're they're in front of Jesus. They're like, you know, what happened? You know, how come we couldn't? And then Jesus kind of responds like, "There's, there's a type of evil spirit that only comes out with fasting, and prayer, right?" And I'm thinking of ministry and of people that want to do something, and that are thinking of of you know, like like our friend that we know who's had these four kids, right? And it's out there still in the streets and. And the question is like, how do you minister to those people? I remember during COVID, um, there was a young man that just showed up to church on a Saturday evening and almost like your story, right? Like he's like, I need a Bible. I need a Bible. And then, I mean, I could go on a tangent with that story, but I feel like for people that want a ministry in that type of realm and the way you describe it, right? When you make decisions, you're, you're kind of like building these walls, but you also talk about almost like this, Um, I don't know if the the right word is like a demonic sense of 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 arena, right? Of a spiritual element of what's happening. Yeah. So, what would be your advice for people that are th that have maybe that that tap on their shoulders as Christians, as believers, to to go and do something? Right here in California, there's there's a lot of um, uh, homeless people, for example. And I see a lot of people wanting wanting to do something, but many times it's like, how do you even start uh, the work when their minds seem so out of place, right? I don't know if it's it's a demonic influence, if it's evil spirits, if it's just uh, you no know, that their mind has been deteriorated by you know by drug abuse and alcohol. So, what's your advice for people that are feeling that that tug from God to say, I want to use you in this space? But you need to be mindful, like Jesus was with the disciples. And it takes, you know, fasting and prayer. What does fasting and prayer look like for us today or in your ministry? Well, you know, and that's that's a part of being a part of the body of Christ and that safety and that protections in numbers. There's strength in numbers. And uh you you operate in herds, you know, you 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 go together, you you pray together, you fast together, and you go out into the world together. You know, he, he sent the disciples two by two. You know, so there, there's, there's, uh, you know, the the Church of Acts. They did every the the first church, the Church of Jesus Christ, in the Book of Acts. I mean, they did everything together. They ate together, they prayed together, they worshiped together. Uh, they're doing life together. You know, I got it printed on T-shirts. I say something to people. They ask me, how do I get started? You know, I want to do this. I want to do that. I, I I got this dream. I got this vision. I got this calling. I believe God's telling me to do. And I and I got it printed on shirts. And I and I tell them, you get started by getting started. Mm simple as that is, you get started by getting started. So many people want to do things, but they don't get in motion. God's not going to move a parked car that we got to start moving, you know, and the closed doors will open us, will they'll, they'll lead us to the open doors if we keep moving, if we keep in motion. So we got to get out there together and get in motion, you know, and you got to look at, you know, what's going on in the church that you're connected to. If you're not connected to a church, get connected to a church. That's where you get planted, you get rooted, and you begin to thrive 
and to see the need that's in the community. And you can do that through the local church, you know, and getting connected together with the body and going out with the body, depending on whatever the need is in your community. But my, but my always is you get started by getting started. You got to get out there, move around. God will direct you as you get in motion. That's so good. I love that. And uh, what does your ministry look like nowadays? I mean, this is Scott. This is this is just awesome. You know that that you went from from a life without Christ and making decisions and being in your own prison, like you mentioned, to to really preaching the good news mm -hmm. <laughs> throughout throughout. I guess the United States, right, and the basically the prison system too, specifically. But what does ministry look like for you? Uh, what success look like for your ministry? What would be a success story? You know, uh, we uh, we have my wife and I founded an organization called Behind the Wire Ministries, and it's a prison organization. We provide Christian services throughout the prison system, but we also have a transitional housing program for men coming out of incarceration. It's a residential recovery center, and it's from nine months to two years, three different phases that we get on the practical side of things uh, to be able to help uh, guys that are transitioning home from being incarcerated uh, on the level, not only to, um, you know, getting your IDs, driver's license, their social security card, birth certificates, insurance, um, you know, the practical things, getting their feet on the ground, obviously with their relationship with Christ and how to live the Christian life. Uh, but also, um, you know, helping them get a job, getting them back and forth to a job, helping them with budgets, helping them establish credit, helping them to just to build a new life. So we're after life change. Mm. We're after true life change that comes with Christ at the center. And then, you know, and then the body of Christ helping through these different practical ways that I just described to help them make the transition from living destructive to living productive. And so today, you know, we we help men and women, you know, not in our recovery center with women, but with we're, we're working with men and women in a lot of different capacities, but we're helping them make a transition uh, to, to be and to become who they were born to be, who we believe that God ordained them to be. And uh, we're, we're helping them cross that bridge from living destructive lives that living behind the wire of that invisible prison to be able to cross that bridge that Christ would set them free to set them loose. Christ has come to set us free to set us loose, man, that he's got something for all of us. And we help them meet with Christ so he can set them free. And then we help nav navigate them through the setting loose mm -hmm. of, 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 of the purpose and the plan that God has for their life. So it's, it's a real blessing that we get to be a part of that. Wow. That's so good. Yeah. It sounds like, Like from your vantage point, what what I'm you know, maybe my takeaway is that productive is the true freedom, right? When you become a productive person, yes. there there's true freedom in that. That's so cool. That's I mean that's the power of the gospel. And uh, here's a question that it might sound a little awkward, but nonetheless, right? I'm I'm Latino. I'm from Mexico. I live here in California, but this is maybe my my conception or what I hear about the prison system and maybe you can either you know, shed some light on it and I think it would be important for people that, that are maybe like me, you know, Latinos that maybe have the same thing, right? But I hear a lot about like, you know, the, the, the prison system, most people are going to be Latinos or the black community that are going to be there and they talk about like almost like a, a, a cycle of uh, lack of you know, parenting or bad parenting that kind of like just continues that cycle. Is that something you've witnessed? Is that true? Is that, you know, is that, <laughs> and I'm saying that, you know, because I hate to use these words, right? But nevertheless, I think these are the words people use, right? Do white people experience the same thing? What's your vantage point when it comes to that? You know, would you say, You're a white man, or do you describe yourself as that? Um, does it matter in the prison system? I think I think that there's uh, it's different in the different prison systems, you know, uh, depending on you know just uh, the geographics of the state. You know, I think in Indiana where I'm at, there's it's a mix. 
you know, of, you know, pretty evenly mixed. And I know in California, it's a little bit different. Uh, so I think it depends on the state, uh, but it's very easy for any of uh, the races to get in unhealthy patterns. And it usually begins with their neighborhoods and their, their, the supervision, their parental supervision or lack of it, you know, and it's the different people that they have leading their lives. Some are gangs, a lot of them are gangs in the prison system. And Mm -hmm. so they start off repeating these habits. And like I said earlier, what you repeat grows stronger and that can go good or bad. So they're repeating unhealthy habits they, and it goes from what they do to who they become. And it just becomes a part of their identity that I'm a gangster, that I'm a drug dealer, that I'm a hustler, uh, that I'm an addict, you know, or that I'm a criminal, you know, and they mm. form these habits over time, no matter the race. And that just becomes a part of their identity. But all the while that their identity has been hidden in Christ and they just don't know it yet. And they can be the ones in their family to break that cycle. Mm. The buck can stop with them that they don't have to follow the lead of maybe their gang leader. They don't have to follow the lead of maybe their uncle or their grandfather or their parent that's leading that life that they can stop. They can, the buck can stop with them. And, you know, how do you change the world? You do it one family at a time. Mm. So. Wow. There's fire right there. So good. Okay. So this is what we're going to do, Scott, to either summarize the episode or to think of the future We're going back to the emojis and the idea is going to be, you know, in the type of work that you do, what's the worst idea? What's the most blasphemous, the the farthest away from God? Is that uh, you can you can never change that you've done too much, that God couldn't set you free, that God couldn't love you by what you've done or where you've been. And that's a lie that God has an everlasting love and that he could. Uh, he can set anybody free that he's big enough, that he's strong enough uh, to be able to set you free and set you loose. Okay, skeptical. So a skeptical emoji, what what makes you doubt still or where do you see skepticism played out? People can argue with the Bible all day long, but you can't argue with the changed life. Mm. The fruit of the life. Oh, you can't so argue good. with that. Wow, okay. Inspired emoji, where do you see inspiration? What gives you hope? That, you know, that God can turn a mess into a message, that God can can take the worst of, of humanity and he is strong enough to turn their life around and to do something great with their life, that God rejoices uh, in, in confounding the wise by taking the weak things of the world and, and really uh, shocking people by how powerful and how good that he can do to inspire you, to draw you in, to want to be a part of his family. One to the last is holy. So what gives you, yeah, what's a holy idea in the type of work that you do? Is that you got to get into the word of God. That's where holiness comes from. You get to the word of God. The, the, that, the, the same word that created everything that the eyes can see, even including yourself, the, the power in that word is the same word that you can put into your mind and transform your mind into having a holy mind, a mind that's fixed, fixed on Christ, a, a mind that um, can move from the darkest of places and to be able to rise above the challenges of life and live a life of holiness and uh, honoring of God. And finally, is the divine emoji. What is the highest idea that you can think of? That he's a miracle worker. That God God can defy even our natural way of thinking. That God does his best work right outside of your thinking. That if you want to walk on water, then you're going to have to step out of the boat. Wow, so powerful right there. Scott, this this has been super helpful. I think, uh, you know, just speak on all levels of your experience. And, you know, I pray for you and your ministry behind the wire that, you know, God God, uh, extends it, that it touches life, that people are transformed because of you guys bringing a word of hope and a word from his word, right, uh, to them. 
So thank you so much. Would you point people, you know, if they want to support you, if they want to get the movie that you released with Michael W. Smith in it, where can people go find that? You can go to our website at www.behindthewireministries.org. Uh, and there is directions on there to be able to uh, follow our ministry, uh, support our ministry, and also links uh, for uh, my book that I wrote, Behind the Wire, A Prisoner's Journey to the Pulpit. And there's links for the feature film that was released about my life called Pardoned by Grace. There you go, my friends. What an awesome episode. Thank you so much for listening and watching. I want to invite you to like, subscribe, share this episode. Visit us at christianpodcast.com. Rate us. Give us a positive review, whether you're watching on Roku TV or on YouTube, right? Um, do something good with this episode. Go and share it. This, there's power in what's been said by Scott, and we pray for his ministry. So I'll see you guys on the next one. Awesome.